at least in some parts of the hemisphere, I will say good afternoon. For others, it's good morning. Welcome all to this hearing on access to truth, justice, and reparation with a gender-based perspective. In Uruguay, we are in our period of sessions of the Commission for Human Rights. My name is Antonia Urrejaola. I am the uh, Rapporteur for Truth, Memory and Justice, and I, I, um, I'm also the Chair of the Commission. I, we have the first Vice President and Rapporteur for Uruguay, Julissa Mantilla, the second Vice President, Flavia Piovesan, and also the Margaret May Macaulay. She's a Rapporteur for Women's Rights. Also, the ex Acting Executive Secretariat, Ms. Pulido, and the Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression and the Pedro Vaca and the rest of the team from the Executive Secretariat. I hope I didn't leave anyone out. Before, or first, first of all, I would like to say that I suppose that, as you know, this board is the first board in the 61 years of the commission that is made up only by women. And I think it's uh, quite relevant that one of our first meetings is specifically on uh, gender-based violence on, in dictatorships, in this case in Uruguay, I feel it's quite symbolic and I think I needed to mention that. So I would like to welcome the representatives of the civil society and the victims, also the delegation from the state. We also have a high level delegation. Afterwards, the uh, state will speak, but you're welcome and thank you for being part of this hearing. And I would also like to say that we have Mr. Jan Jaraf, he's the representative of the Office of the High Commissioner of the UN for the Southern Corn, Cone. And well, he will introduce himself and he will say the exact name because it's not just the Southern Corn, but several countries. So uh, I would like to welcome you all. This hearing will be uh, structured in the following way. First of all, we will listen to the civil society for 20 minutes. You will see a timer on the screen once you start speaking. And five minutes before it times up, I will try to let you know, trying not to interrupt you, but I will let you know and afterwards the state will be able to speak for another 20 minutes and then the UN expert will have the floor then the commission will speak for 20 minutes making some comments or questions afterwards we will listen again to the civil society and the states 10 minutes each why we are quite strict with time because it's the only way we can uh, make these hearings work. So please, I uh, try to uh, mute yourselves while you're not speaking. And also please keep your cameras on. The Rapporteur for uh, Economic, Cultural, Environmental Rights is here too. Soledad Garcia Muñoz, I didn't see her. I apologize, I didn't mention her, but she here she is. So having said this, I will now give the floor to the civil society. Please um, introduce yourselves as you speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. President, we will start by sharing a video. lack of access to justice for women who were victims of sexual torture during the Uruguayan dictatorship. We couldn't die without people knowing the atrocities uh, we suffered. And this is one of the angles, sexual abuse. We would meet others and say, we need to do something, especially when we saw that it looked like women had not existed memory was about the men, the heroes. On October 2011, we presented the, uh, we filed the lawsuit and we tried to fight in any way we could. 
but on, there is only one person who was prosecuted and is now dead, but over almost 100 people are accused. The memory of the former political prisoners continues to be invisibilized. The first step was asking yourself, can I speak about this? Who will be listening to me? What will they understand? I myself don't understand what happened. And what will others do with what you say? How can they assimilate what you're saying? We have never been able to talk about it, not with our husbands, our children, our friends or our mothers. It took us over 30 minutes to say what had been done to us. The most difficult part here is being able to take that step, which is not a small step, it's a giant step, deciding to start talking about it because unfortunately we've made a lot of progress, but we still see in society the stigma of abused women. I always thought that if one day that happened, I would bite him, I would scratch him, I would kick him in his genitals. I thought you could defend yourself, but I didn't do anything. They, the interrogators, the torturers, they knew that was helpful for them because we had, um, we had done, we were guilty of two crimes. We were women and we were activists, two serious crimes. We want to say that we were not heroes. We were regular women, just like the men. The lack of understanding by the justice in general on how to handle these issues is very concerning. The one under suspicion is always the woman. They first ask what that woman was doing, how she was dressing, what time it was. It's a situation that it you need to overcome that. Even though you know that people will think that, you still need to report it. I have an advantage because I was able to report this in front of a judge. It was the hardest part. A judge who was 30 kilometers from where I was, even though he was sitting, he was sitting next to me, but he seemed so far away, so distant. He had no way, he couldn't understand what we were saying. So it was particularly difficult to talk about what had happened. You think you were just a girl, a child. In all the sequels that left sexually, it was very difficult for me to feel not good. I didn't want to. Many a time, they say, well, he lost control. It wasn't that they lost control. It wasn't, uh, no, there was a whole conception, a whole plan that that had to be done in that way. And that's what they did. This person, this judge would ask things like if we had we, if we knew if they had used condoms when they violated us, when they raped us. Some, uh, to some they said, well, what was your responsibility in your organization? But I'm here to report that I was raped. What does that have to do with anything? We will continue to fight for truth and justice. Honorable Commission. My name is Maria Noel Leoni from the Center for Justice and International Law, and along with Flor de Maria Mesatanata from the University of the Republic, we come here with 14 women who have been waiting for a decade for justice for the torture and violence they were subjected to during the dictatorship. The Commission will today listen to two of them, Jacqueline Gurruchaga and Blanca Luz Menendez. This Commission is very much aware that during the dictatorship in Uruguay, several violations to human rights were committed along as, as, along as, as well as crimes against humanity. And it knows that the debt has not been 
uh, settled. 36 years after the return of the democracy, there has not been a lot of progress and there are usually step backs. Just in, in 2011, and as a consequence of the international, uh, the international support, Uruguay uh, finally revoked the law of Ley de Caducidad or Law of Prescription. According to the civil society, over 70% of the 200 active call cases are just starting on the initial stages. There are convictions in only 14 proceedings against 30 people. The obstacles of justice are many. There is no conventionality control. Investigations are not automatically uh, opened and they allow uh, delay tactics, delaying test tactics on, on behalf of the defendants. The lack of justice is not just the responsibility of the judiciary because it has to do with the lack of policy from the state, which should listen to the victims. We are not moving forward. Right now, there have been very concerning proposals from the state that would mean several steps back, including reinstalling an amnesty law or questioning the need for justice. So all these factors had led the case of the petitioners to uh, remain impune. But there's also stigmat uh, stigmatization, re-victimization, and the discrimination faced by women who report sexual violence, which is specifically serious and typical of women who suffer these, these cases of violence in context of conflict and detentions when there is terrorism, state terrorism. As, long in, as, in, uh, as well as in other places, Uruguay has also used sexual violence to humiliate women who were political prisoners. And as in many other cases, there's also lack of justice in Uruguay and lack of recognition by the, po by poli by the political world and the society. So far, there have been no convictions for sexual violence during the dictatorship. There, recently, the uh, petitioners were once again asked to retell what happened to them. And some of the petitioners were led to the hearing by force because they didn't want to attend. The commission has acknowledged the stigma and the obstacles survivors suffered when they wished to report this, but this has not made them quiet. They have been reporting their truths even at the, sil at the face of the silence of the state and the society. They will still speak but they, because they hope that the state will finally recognize their truth. We have our strong conviction that this hearing and the way of the international justice will finally help to uh, stop the silence. Desde la sala Mayolo, perdón, están en silencio. Um, I'm sorry, you're muted. The Mayolo room, you're muted. Shall I start? We are a group of women, former political prisoners who were kidnapped, tortured, and sexually abused during the state terrorism in our country. Our complaint group is made up of women that belong to different organizations, political organizations, and we were arrested between 1972 and 1983 in different places of our country by members of the political police and by military men of all weapons. The systematization and repetition of the repressive procedures we were subjected to shows the nature of crimes against humanity and shows that rape against women was part of a method of torture that ensured a level of damage that left sequels to us, us both at a physical and psychological level that were very difficult to overcome. We've recovered democracy in Uruguay 36 years ago, 10 years since the 
prescription law of the state of the state's punitive claim was cancelled in addition to different pronouncements, different statements and recommendations by different organizations of human rights, we have still not received full reparation. We denounce more than 100 people, officers, doctors, psychologists, and only one of them was prosecuted, not because of torture or sexual violence, which he confessed during the process, but because of repeated crimes of deprivation of, of liberty, of freedom. Within the framework of a culture of impunity that has been built by the state, we've been subjected to re-victimization processes. In the different instances, we've made, uh, they've made us testify several times and to relive the situations of sexual violence that planned and throughout a decade of state terrorism, we suffered a large group of women that were previously political prisoners, who were subjected to psychiatric exams where they asked for details about the sexual torture. For example, if what we received were not well, we were in our menstrual periods, if we were pregnant, if, they, if we had had abortions. At each stage of the process, it is women, the, the ones who complain and are victims of state terrorists, the ones who have to show evidence of each of the perpetrators were protected by impunity or by um, delay remedies that obstacle the actions of justice. We've shared waiting rooms in the courts together with the torturers or with their defense lawyers who also interrogated us with verbal and symbolic violence. The lack of justice made us live or live coexist in the same society with our torturers. Since 1992, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has observed our country with a report that, that assures that the prescription law is incompatible with the American Declaration on Human Rights. In 2011, the court sentenced your wife for the Hellman case and ordered the state to ensure the non-repetition of these events. In July 2016, the Sadao committee observed and recommended to our state um, about the situation of women who suffer gender-based violence during state terrorism. In paragraph 21, the committee noted the absence of specific mechanisms in the Uruguayan justice systems to provide reparations or compensation to women who had been victims to sexual violence or other violations to, the, to their human rights during the dictatorship. They also noted the lack of processes to establish the truth about the violation of human rights of women during that period. The committee recommended to the Uruguayan state to adopt a strategy to prosecute and punish the perpetrators of violations of women's rights during the dictatorship, and also to adopt measures in order to facilitate a rapid reparation, mainly compensations and symbolic reparations for women who were victims of these violations. Despite these international condemnations, our cause is still at an initial stage, that is to say, preliminary investigation stage. There are still statements being taken to defendants and to complainants, but the two people that are investigated by the prosecution office have not been interrogated yet. The victims, their families, and those of us who live in Uruguay have the right to know the full truth public and complete truth and their specific circumstances and who were the people who participated in the events as a complement to full justice. It is the state that must comply with its obligation to protect its inhabitants and to ensure access to truth. Moreover, it has the obligation to ensure respect for human rights included in the different treaties that are both at a regional or global level. We want to receive full justice and reparation and that the state recognizes that it violated our rights and that it can be disseminated because it is part of our right to reparation and to the warranty or non-repetition. 
we would also like to say that in March 2020, the psychological and psychiatric services were discontinued, the ones that we were receiving as political prisoners, as well as our children and grandchildren, according to what is established by Article 10 of Law 18596. Today, after 48 years of the beginning of these uh, tortures and violations by the state, we are here. Uh, it is almost 10 years after we made the complaint and we are still waiting for justice. In historical times, this is a small period, but in human times, this is more than half of the current lifespan or average lifespan. During these years, three colleagues who started this complaint have already died. It is not personal interest that moves us. We are social fighters, strugglers, and we would like to contribute from this place to build an institutional framework in our country that ensures to our sons, daughters, grandchildren, and to the future generations, the warranties of non-repetition, of intolerance, abuse, discrimination, and arbitrariness by the state to its citizens. We believe in justice and we want to live in a country that listens to us and which has the capacity to give truth, justice and reparation. That's why we've waited for 10 years for a response that meets the international commitments of the state. However, the time that has elapsed only makes the impact of violation worse and impunity worse. Every passing day without justice, our dignity is affected. By means of this hearing, we start a road to find international justice. We hope that this commission will listen and accept our requests. If we contribute to a cultural change where respect for our peers, equal rights, the truth as a tool to build the future is consolidated, we will be satisfied. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we ask the Uruguayan state to recognize that during the state terrorism, there were serious violations to human rights against people that were arrested, including sexual torture as a way of punishment for women that were arrested for having dared to defy the gender mandates, which still remain. That the culture of impunity may be left aside, invisibility and oblivion that was built from the state and society regarding the violence exerted by the agents to women that were detained during state terrorism. And that during within this framework, there is a design of a public policy that recognizes the rights to truth and comprehensive reparation of victims of sexual violence. That the state may remove the obstacles that we are facing in the search of truth, justice, and reparation. That is to say that the judicial power might do what is necessary so as not to re-victimize women that are victims of gender violence and that it will act with due diligence and meeting its obligations that derive from the American Convention and from the Convention of Belém do Pará in Article 7b, which establishes the obligation of the states, uh, member states to use due diligence to prevent and eradicate violence against women, that the incorporation of gender perspective in justice may also be accompanied by gender sensitive training, according to what the committee said in order to, it, to uh, the committee for the elimination of discrimination against women in the Uruguayan state. This committee highlighted its concern regarding the impunity for cases of violence against women and emphasized it's concerned about the prejudices that already exist that do not provide enough protection to women who report these cases to the courts. We know that the impunity of the violations to human rights, such as sexual torture, favors the perpetuation of gender violence and the social acceptance of this phenomenon, as well as the feeling and sense of insecurity of women and the mistrust of women in the way in which justice is administered. Many years have gone by without any response from the justice system. The 
the women say that the time of justice is not their own time, but if time is money, then in terms of procedure, that is justice. Therefore, commissioners, we ask the Uruguayan justice to act reasonably to comply with its obligation to make justice and vindicate the dignity of these women. That is the fundamental assumption for the exercise of their rights as people. Finally, we ask the Inter-American Commission to make a follow-up. We ask the Inter-American Commission to make a visit, a virtual visit to Uruguay together with the Rapporteur of Memory, Truth and Justice and the Country Rapporteur in order to examine the obstacles to access to justice in the cases of violations to human rights committed during the dictatorship, putting a special emphasis on women victims of sexual torture. We also ask you to provide technical support in order to monitor our process. In this sense, we consider it would be very valuable for the Inter-American Commission to provide the state with a technical note to systematize the standards that should guide the due diligence in the investigation of sexual violence cases like this one. And above all, the assessment that should be done of the testimony of the victims and the importance of the non re victimization Thank you. Thank you very much. I understand that um, you are done. We are uh, running a bit late. The time was up. I didn't want to interrupt you, but you've spoken for two minutes more than, than you should. So now we'll give the floor to the state. If the state wants, they can also use two extra minutes in their intervention. So as you take the floor, please introduce yourselves as well. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Marina Sande, Director of the Department of Human Rights of the Foreign Affairs Ministry of Uruguay. The Uruguayan state has the pleasure to be here in this hearing where we are called within the framework of the uh, 179th session, period of sessions of the Commission, and it congratulates the uh, commissioners that are present here. The state wants to point out the value of this hearing and the importance of these hearings that brings greater transparency and becomes a very relevant tool to achieve justice for this case. As we start this presentation, allow me to introduce the delegation that joins me here, Ambassador Luis Bermudez from the Department of Political Affairs of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Luján Criado, representing Matilde Rodríguez Larreta, Director of Human Rights Department on the previous, uh, for the previous administration, Ricardo Percivale, in charge of the prosecution of office uh, specialized in crimes against humanity, Dr. Nicastro from the Court of Justice, and myself, Marina San. Madam Commissioner, the Uruguayan state acknowledges, condemnates, and repudiates the abuses and the crimes committed during the dictatorship that took place in our country between 1973 and 1985. Consequently, Uruguay has taken decisive steps once the democracy came back, and we continue doing so with the aim of reaching truth and condemning the people guilty of those severe crimes. Within this framework, our country would like to say and to state that we understand and that there is solidarity from our side to the victims, acknowledging the suffering that such tortures, violations, and sexual abuse caused during that period cost them during that period. We would like to point out that Uruguay, since the democracy came back, continues conducting all possible efforts to reach justice and to condemn the perpetrators of those terrible crimes. In accordance with that, we've passed laws such as 18.839 that overruled the prescription law, and we have created agencies for that purpose as well. In that sense, 
since its creation in 2018, the Specialized Prosecution for Crimes Against Humanity is working for, to try to find missing people and to try to understand the forced disappearance of people related to human rights, as well as the identification of those people who are responsible and guilty. We've investigated actions and that took place during the dictatorship related to the victims that requested this hearing. And we finalized the investigations that allowed us to reach the factual knowledge of the situation, as well as to identify those people responsible for it. Our country is very responsible respectful of the rule of law as well as the, of the division of powers within the framework of our country we validate the actions of each of the agencies we understand the deficiencies of our judicial system which is a system that is frequently dominated by the procedural stages mainly the ones that allow for exceptions that make the processes become way too delayed. We would like to point out that that doesn't imply that we accept it, the respect of the norms and of the procedures established there is what causes the delays and the actions or the exceptions that very frequently are used with delay purposes by the people who, who are involved in those causes. The processes that were conducted in the case of the victims that are represented here have taken a long time of procedures due to procedural causes that were abusive by the defense of the, the, the people and those who represent the judicial power here will be able to explain this further. It is important to point out that the secretariat uh, and all the members that are present here as well, we foster and we support the state in looking for the truth for and repudiate the acts that we mentioned during the dictatorship time. We would like to say that the cause, Asuara Lucia and others, started in the year 2011, and due to different reasons, it has been in charge of three judges, and is current, currently in 27 tour. The specific cases related to sexual abuse as a method of torture and the transversality all of, of all of this implies a specific investigation because we are talking about different centers of arrest and at different times, the different realities of each case imply that there is great complexity in them. We should take into account that the people responsible of guilty to be um, to be followed or to be analyzed implies also great difficulty and the impossibility to reach a fast answer. As a consequence of this large amount of people denounced, the cause was interrupted several times because of the exceptions that were asked by the defense, as well as the prescription cases of laws 18, uh, 831. It is important to point out that the prosecution office in December, uh, uh, not long after it was created, asked for the prosecution of four people that were interviewed, but it has not been finished yet. During in the in the meantime, two of those people died, but the hearing for the two others is planned for tomorrow, March 19th, 2021. The judge will be ha, will have access to the requisition and to the petitions for that case. We ask, there are two requests for extradition. One of them is ongoing and the other one, it was presented in the headquarters directly. As of the request of the prosecution's office, we ask for the international capture of a former military and a member and a police. The rest of the people involved after we conduct the, this hearing, the prosecution office will conduct the processing requests 
Once the facts are already verified, we would like to point out that, as we mentioned briefly, and in order to respect the time that we have, the state will continue doing every effort to clarify these facts and to arrest those people who are guilty. The delays are not voluntary at all, and they are not aimed at bringing a different resolution. But as we said before, they are a consequence of the different actions that the defendants of the people might have included and that might have an abusive uh, an abusive use. I will give the floor to the representative of the um, judicial power. Good morning, everyone. As we all know, this, uh, suit was, this complaint was presented in 2011 and in 2018, the public prosecution asked for the uh, prosecution and imprisonment of several of the accused parties. Recently, uh, the appeal of, the, uh, of some of the accused was issued and it confirmed the initial resolution that rejected the defense for a statute of limitation that had been presented. Now, with regards to the actions of the judiciary, yes, it is true, it is undeniable. If the report was presented in 2011 and we are still on the initial stage and none of the accused have been prosecuted in spite of the request by the public prosecutor, there was definitely an unreasonable delay. Nevertheless, as the, our Ministry for Foreign Affairs has shown, this had not to do with a will by the judiciary to delay the duty of the state to find out the truth and punish those at fault. The proceeding is going through the our old code, our old criminal code from 1980. The judiciary through its courts and judges had not a way because it wasn't allowed to by this legislation to actually investigate because according to this code, all reports needed to be investigated and researched in a different way. Apart from the criminal proceeding for these cases on the old code and the old criminal code, this has meant, as we all know, international observations with regards to the disregard for minimum standards of reasonable duration and human rights warranties and the distinction between the duty to investigate and to try. Also, the defenses have presented different um, motions that are institutes that are uh, that they have presented different motions that have warranties recognized by the law and by our state. They have the right to present them. So this, our Supreme Court, which is the organization I represent right here, has used in several opportunities the uh, fa their faculty of um, anticipatory decision what are we trying what are they trying to do to use consolidated case law of the supreme court in order to shorten the proceeding of for unconstitutionality and this suspends the cases so once the uh, defense for inconstitutionality is presented the case is suspended and sent to the supreme court so as far as it could, the Supreme Court has tried to shorten the uh, time, the time, the, the waiting time. And it has proved, shown that this is not an obstacle for the finding out of the truth. Also, the proceeding for these cases of serious violations of human rights is the same proceeding for all processes. So 
even though the needs for repair and truth are very important for all of the claimants and the entire civil society and the inhabitants of Uruguay and the international community, these warranties are enshrined in our constitution on, on the Inter-American Convention for Human Rights and other international treaties that our country has ratified. Now, with regards to the actions of the judiciary, the Supreme Court through the uh, Center for Legal Studies in Uruguay has created training courses about human rights and humanitarian law, about gender-based violence and domestic violence, both at the initial levels for attorneys who wish to become judges and also as tra tra training education programs for actual judges. And very important experts from different NGOs have been part of this because the idea is to train all of the judiciary operators on how important these cases are. It is also important to point out that the judiciary is part of the working process of the interbody group, gender interbody group of the UN and with the uh, public prosecutor's office through the Center for the Training of Public Prosecutors and other bodies of the public prosecutor's office. They have uh, identified, shown that they wish to, uh, to work for early identification and the prevention of gender discrimination. That's how uh, this led to the creation of guidelines on, uh, gen on, on sorry, uh, information about gender-based violence, and also new courses were created about this issue. Tomorrow, actually, there will be a ratifying hearing, and there, the uh, judge that's uh, at hearing this case will um, will rule about the uh, about what's going to happen with the investigation of this case. Thank you very much. Okay, now I will give the floor to Public Prosecutor Festivale. And, well, first of all, I would like to tell the victims that it's always a pleasure to to be in contact with them and especially if we if we are here with the commission because this argue is because it's an institution that seeks justice and truth and of course everything you said is absolutely understandable what happened to you and what's happening to you we everything is fully understandable but we wish to say, we wish to convey the public prosecution's commitment to double our efforts for truth, justice, and non-repetition warranties. So we believe that this hearing is very important to uh, come back on this issue, to review new opportunities, to deepen into this case and something that's very important that the um, my colleague has just mentioned from the perspective of the public prosecution the investigation is final we know what happened to you where it happened to you and who were responsible and i would like to say something because during the statement of the claimants, they said that they had that the evidence had been provided only by the victims, but that is not completely correct because the public prosecutor prosecution has also presented um, experts 
the expert statements, we have analyzed everything that was given by all sources and we processed all the data and we added it up to the statements of the victims and the, the witnesses who were um, brought to us by the victims. And that's how we reached this final point where we are right now. We know that from the investigation point of view, this is solved. And I think it's good for you to know this so you can rest assured that the public prosecution has concluded the, the investigation. It's clear on the fact and what you are saying is absolutely proven. Of course, this now has other um, steps, other procedural steps that are part of uh, the rule of law in the state where we live. Of course, we will try to make this faster to make the case uh, go further, but from the investigation point of view, there's already a resolution here. We wouldn't want to wrap up our, in, our intervention without saying that for Uruguay, human rights and their defense has always been a priority, a matter of principle, a uh, policy of state, no matter who is in the government. With the exception of the dictatorship we are dealing with right now, and this uh, is shown in the work of the uh, of the state and how many treaties it has signed. We are aware that the progress we have achieved should have been more, especially for those who were victims and who have been waiting for so many years for their justice. We, the progress is slow but steady. The investigations were never stopped, nor were the proceedings. We never, the, the state was always committed to fight the obstacles, the previous obstacles and the obstacles that remain. The state, after democracy came back, has always fought for truth, to pun, for the punishment of those who um, committed the crimes and has always understood the victims of state terrorism who are represented here. I would like to say once again that Uruguay for legal and ethical reasons has the will and the commitment to keep on moving forward, looking for truth and justice. And we will strengthen our work. We will continue to fight for truth and we will never stop. Finally, to wrap up this opening statement, we would like to stress that the Uruguayan state has uh, understanding and solidarity for the victims. It understands that the conducts you are, re the, the, the behaviors you are reporting need to be judged and punished. Gender, based issues are a priority for Uruguay and the world. Thank you very much. Thank you to the delegation of the state. I will now give the floor to the expert and representative from the Office of the High Commissioner of the UN. Mr. Harab, you will have seven minutes. Madam President, commissioners, victims, representatives of the state, good morning to you all. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you. I would like to thank you for your invitation to be part of this public hearing as a representative, as a regional representative for South America of the High Commissioner of the Human Rights, of the, the UN Commissioner for Human Rights. First of all, I would like to express our solidarity to the victims. Our office has always followed this case. It has had, it has talked to the victims and it has met with the national authorities. We find this hearing is particularly interesting for us because the legal proceeding has not moved forward, at least not enough since it was first opened in 2011. First of all, I would like to point out that 
gender-based perspective should be incorporated in every aspect of this issue because what these women are reporting is originated by the fact that they are women and has a very uh, and has a gender component of course let's remember that the committee for the elimination of discrimination against women in its general recommendation number 35 on gender-based violence pointed out that states are uh, com are compelled to uh, to protect women in its regulations and training and also to uh, legally punish those who commit violence against women or discriminate against them and in particular in cases that are inter uh, that are international crimes as the victims have already mentioned in their final observations about uruguay the uh, Sadao committee mentioned the lack of proceedings to establish truth, the absence of mechanisms to provide reparations for women who were victim of sexual violence and other violations of their human rights during the dictatorship. The committee recommended the state to adopt a strategy to try and punish the authors of human rights violations during the uh, de facto regime. I also, it also recommended for the state to adopt measures to facilitate soon uh, prompt reparation, in particular compensations and symbolic reparations for women who were victims of these violations. Along, and the Sedao committee, uh, in the case of, in a case related to Bosnia and Herzegovina, established that there was guilt in the state's delay to um, compensate and provide reparations to the victims. In 2014, in its report on their visit to Uruguay, the uh, Special Rapporteur of the UN on the Promotion of Truth, Justice and Non-Repetition Warranties identified that there's a lack of address of the uh, cases of sexual violence during the dictatorship. They recommended training the staff in charge of, uh, of dealing with the victims and uh, modifying mechanisms in order to prevent revictimization. They also appointed the issues that lead to the lack of access to reparation, like incompatibility between pensions and reparations, and the conditions that are um, demanded in order to provide reparation, and also the demands, the requirement for the victims to present proof, physical proof of what they have suffered. It should, the state should also take into consideration the age of the victims. Uruguay has also decided to observe certain recommendations of the universal system on human rights and uh, in a quite generic way. There are recommendations like the uh, World Periodic uh, Examination in 2019 and a visit by the Human Rights Committee in 2013. We have also presented, um, we have so, uh, presented a list of recommendations that the country has received. Finally, the office considers that considering human rights standards, these conditions that we have mentioned and the arguments presented by the victims and the representatives, the request of access to truth and justice is as legitimate as urgent. So our office calls for overcoming impunity and removing all of the obstacles victims are still facing in their search for truth and justice. We celebrate the opportunity, this forum that Uruguay has historically committed to is finally able to find a way to ensure their right 
to of access to justice and reparation. These two elements are pillars in order to generate non-repetition warranties and to strengthen the rule of law and democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, representative of the High Commissioner. Now I will give the floor to my colleagues. Uh, we have 20 more minutes, so I will ask all colleagues to try and uh, stick to the time. We, I know we get enthusiastic in, in these meetings, so please let's try to stick to the time. I will leave the floor first to the first Vice President and Rapporteur for Uruguay, Julissa Mantilla. Thank you so much, Madam President. I will start by respectfully greeting the victims, showing my solidarity and the acknowledgement of how difficult it must be to be here now. Even if it's uh, an achievement, even if it's important, it is difficult indeed after so many years to have to tell this story again. So that's the first thing I would like to say and for the delegation of the state as well. Based on what I had heard, I have specific questions. In the case of the state, although I've heard, and I think it is very important, this gender-based training that the people from the judicial power had or received. I want you to pose a question. That training was only in gender or investigating the gender-based crimes during the dictatorship? Because a general training, yes, it is important, of course, but what are the concrete measures that were taken for training in line with what the representative of the UN was saying about sexual violence in particular? That is to say, in a, within a context of dictatorship. Second, I also value the information that we received about the investigation of crime, crimes against humanity, forced uh, missing people. I think that is so important, but I think, but I would like to know whether there are lines of research for that specific case in terms of sexual violence. Third, I understand the procedural parts, the warranties, which is, of course, very important and necessary. But again, my question is, for the case of sexual violence, not in order to leave aside the, the warranties, but are there actions that have been conducted concretely in this line? Because a technical note the Commission, uh, of course, is willing to provide might help with the last latest standards, mainly Castro against Peru that we dealt with in the commission and in the Inter-American Court. And finally, fourth question, the legislation, domestic Uruguayan legislation, do they make a specific analysis on sexual violence in the context of the dictatorship, in addition to the general violence, which are the procedural guidelines for the justification or to address this topic in particular? And then finally, Although it has been said, there is a process that should be respected, but I wanted to know whether there are other measures for repair, for reparation, because justice is not only the judicial process, but the acknowledgement, the uh, measures to accompany victims and the reparation, which are the actions then that the state is taking in this regard. And in the case of victims, I know that you've talked about sequels, and I would like to know whether any of you, if you want, of course, to take the floor. In addition to the judicial process, justice is not equal, it's not a synonym of the judicial process. What else do you need? Would you need to feel repaired? That is to say, not only with what happened, but with the delays for this investigation. Thank you so much. You're muted. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize, I was muted. Okay, so um, Margaret Macaulay, do you want to take the floor, uh, Commissioner, as a uh, commissioner dealing with uh, the issue of women? Would you like to take the floor? I can't see your face here, but go ahead if you want. You can't. Um, yes, um, thank you, Madam President. Uh, for giving me the floor. Um, I must say good, good morning to everyone, the state representative of the state, the representatives of the petitioners and civil society and the um, uh, 
Mr. Uh, John uh, from the <laughs> United Nations. Hello, all of you. I, I, um, it always saddens me when I listen to accounts of um, a good number of women um, from the um, past authoritarian states and what they suffered, qua women and sexually though, because sex is used during times of conflict as a weapon against women to demoralize them and, and destroy their dignity in every single way. And it is extremely sad, it's saddening to, to listen to how states in the region do not act as they should with due diligence and as quickly as possible when the, the state return to the democracy to rectify and repair all the injuries that the women have suffered because they've suffered not, not only just physical injury, but they were tortured in, in this regard. And, and one is always very sad and disappointed, disappointed that states take such an in, in, inordinately long time to come to the fact of actual, uh, um, actually dealing with these violations and, and seeking to repair them. And one thing which as the rapporteur of women's rights and the rapporteur for also the disadvantaged groups of Afro descendants, of which there are women as well, I would like to say that if states could consider that one of the first acts of reparation, which they ought to do in instances like this, is to apologize to each individual woman publicly. And then in addition, they must, must think of a commemorative act that could be done, putting up a plaque somewhere in the city, acknowledging the wrong which was done to them. And then we deal with other, uh, other acts of reparation. But of, of course, the most important was due diligence investigation, which must be done as quickly as possible. But now, it has to be completed now. It's taken too, too long. And I accept, I, I, I adopt all that has been said before by, by all the, 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 those who spoke before me, because we don't have time to keep on uh, going over everything. So I, I, I want to ask the the um, civil society, the representatives, whether they consider those two acts of reparation, which I have suggested, would be valuable to them. And if so, could they speak out today so that we as the commission can put it forward to the state? Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Margaret. I will give the floor to Flavia Piovesan now. Thank you so much, Madam President. I will also start by making my greeting to the civil society, to the collective of women. So my full admiration and respect for your struggle, for truth, dignity, reparation, and for the capacity of resistance against violence. Not only sexual violence, but also institutional violence. So all my solidarity and the acknowledgement of the Commission. I also value the representation of the state represented here with the presence of the prosecutor's office, the judicial power, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, their commitment that they are showing to at times take effective measures. I would like to pose three questions. First, in line with what the commissioner, commissioner said, the training, the training of the judicial power members, because I believe that there are two components important here, the, perspective, the gender perspective, yes, 
and the perspective mainly on the impress on the possibility of the crimes against humanity. We are analyzing criminal processes or the interpretation of them, saying that some crimes against the uh, crimes against, the, against humanity would not prescribe. And I would like to know into further details, what is the state policy in this regard and what is the training policy as well? My second question is related to the protocols. Are there harmonized protocols for the investigation and for processing these cases of sexual violence? That is to say, are there protocols that include a gender perspective already? And my third question, I go back to what Margaret said, the rapporteur for the rights of women, what she said about integral reparation or all-encompassing reparation. Is it ensured that the participation of victims will be included? That is to say, will they do active listening to the victims? And I go back to, to this same topic by asking the civil society in terms of the non-repetition warranties. What are the structural changes or the frameworks? Maybe we could call it legal frameworks and public policies that are necessary in order to avoid that today, girls and women. And that is to say that there is an intergenerational pact or agreement so that we can all be free of violence. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I can't see, uh, I don't know what's happening with my uh, Zoom platform. I can only see myself or the person who's speaking. I don't know if there's anyone else who would like to take the floor, the interim secreta secretary or any special rapporteur. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to take the floor. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge the victims who have participated in this hearing for their courage. You are an example for all the women who have been victims of sexual violence. You need a lot of courage indeed to make this kind of testimony and to defend such a case. One question that is technical. In Uruguay, is there a possibility, I mean, regardless of the advances that the prosecutor's office has spoken about, today, what he mentioned, and of course, we took down note of it. But is there a possibility to have a mechanism that may advance with the reparation, mainly the reparation in this case could be thought of together with the rest of the elements that the previous commissioners and and rapporteurs mentioned? Is there a money repair that could possibly be conducted by means of independent mechanisms parallel to the judicial investigation. I think it should be very important to get to know this information in your way. And I apologize if, from a technical point of view, it is not possible to answer my question. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Now, the rapporteur for cultural and um, Economic rights is asking for the floor, Soledad Garcia. Good morning, everyone. Uh, solidarity, solidarity and a big hug to all of you, to the climates of for these hearings. I've met them more than once in Uruguay and my greetings to the representatives of the state and of the UN as well. Very briefly, I've heard during the hearing that the service of psychological attention, the psychological care was cancelled. The, the, and I would like to maybe align with the what happened with other cases versus Mexico. I think it is very useful for the analysis of the actions that have been taken and will be taken. Is there any other plan from the point of view of providing psychological, psychiatric, or medical care for free and immediately 
after this hearing by means of public institutions, public health institutions, provided to the victims or to their family members, because I think that that also is part of the reparation that we are asking for. And I just dare put this uh, in this topic or to pose this question so that it can also advance truth, justice, and reparation for all these women that we admire so much. Thank you. Thank you, Rapporteur. So, the Rapporteur of Freedom of Expression, I don't know if you want to take the floor, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam President. So I will start by showing my solidarity to the victims as well and for their for their testimony to the state of Uruguay as well. And just a reflection to start with. Over and over throughout these days, it seems that we are asking victims to understand the justice systems when it should be the other way around. The justice systems and its operators, the ones that should understand the situation of the victims, the due diligence, the due process. Yes, that's part of human rights. But this kind of procedural patience that we need to have is not proportional to the amount of time that has already gone by. And that that it may have in the reposition of justice, uh, of memory. Who is actually talking about this? And our generation is the one in charge of taking measures so that we will not listen to these kind of testimonies in the future. Not because we do not want to continue listening to them, but for the future, that there will not be any other victims like this. Uh, so, we really need to acknowledge that, that. And I would like to pose two questions that came up during this hearing. First of all, you talked about stigmatization. So if you could, either now or, or afterwards in writing, if you could share with the rapporteurship which were the characteristics of this stigmatization, which could be, who could be the people that are disseminating this, because we are very much interested in understanding whether from this discourse, whether the victims are still stigmatized. And second question, something that from this rapporteurship we are paying a lot of uh, paying a lot of attention, access to information. I would like to know whether the information available of this for this is of high quality and is it timely in order to be able to make a follow-up of the judicial process. Now I will give the floor back to you, Ms. Madam President. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, just very briefly, I would like to say, first of all, to thank the presence of the victims of the civil society and the high level of members of the state that are present here. I would like to remind some topics because I was also a rapporteur of Uruguay and with the president of the commission at that time, we made a visit to Uruguay two years ago. And one of the things that we analyzed was the, the legal interpretation in crimes against humanity. In that visit, we made a communique showing our concern for the interpretation that was given in the criminal cases that deny the lack of prescription to the cases of crimes against humanity. Okay, the uh, prescription law has been overruled, but after this visit, we still got some reports or notifications that there is lack from the judicial power. They do not have clarity on this regard related to the prescriptibility of crimes against humanity. And the civil society organizations have also told us about delay tactics or about the questions posed by the different courts. We've, we've seen some advances in against the case of Gerardo Alter some years ago, where we acknowledged that the Supreme Court had limited or restricted the applicability of the prescription law. However, I would like to point this out again, because it is essential that the judicial authorities may be clear about it, unequivocally, showing that the crimes against humanity 
do not prescribe. So the need to meet the Inter American standards, I mean, it's an obligation. And we repeat this to the European state to comply with the recommendations of the Inter American uh, Court in the case of Hellman. You need to clarify that and to punish the people who are responsible. And this is not only related to prescription, but also to the need of removing any obstacles, even if it's a legal, judicial obstacle, in order to reach truth and reparation. So in that case, I share what the state said, that there were warranties of the accused and that they had the right as well to have their rights respected. Yes, but I also remind you of the duty to respect the rights of the victims. And when there is a delay in justice like this, you're not respecting the warranties of the victims. So that's still a challenge for the Uruguayan state, regardless of the willingness that you've shown here in this hearing. It's taken so many years. So it is a challenge. And as we've pointed out here, the victims are dying. So it is a challenge that becomes urgent, urgent. We are getting to know a case here that it belongs to the year 2011, a long time, and the advances in the investigations are quite slow. So in that sense, I would like to ask the state, the commissioner Mantisha already mentioned this, I would like to see your willingness, the state's willingness to accept the requests done by the civil society and the rapporteur of the country as well showed this, your willingness to actually agree with what we are saying. We would like to know the willingness of the European state in this regard. And another question that was already pointed out by my colleagues, about the economic repair, reparation. In Uruguay, as in many other countries, the economic reparation, in addition to the legal ones, are initiatives of the executive by administrative units or, or draft laws. And I would like to know whether in the state, whether you have any draft law or any initiative in this regard for the economic reparation. Thank you so much. I will give the floor then first to the civil society so that you can make any further comments. You have 10 minutes and then afterwards the state will take the floor for 10 more minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much everyone for your comments. Even though we will be presenting a written statement to reply to the statement by the state and the questions of the commission, we would like to clarify certain things. First of all, I will start and then I will give the floor to uh, my colleagues. First of all, it's we are very thankful for the um, new hearing that will occur tomorrow. We understand that this is in response to a request presented in 2018 and it's now happening uh, so it's not a coincidence the the timing i mean of course it is important we agree with the comments and the questions of the commission because we under we would like to know uh, for example with about what Ms. Mantilla was saying, because we think that the information presented by the state is relevant, but perhaps it's not particularly relevant to this hearing and does not propose a specific commission, uh, a commitment to the claimants. As the rapporteur for the freedom of expression, it would seem like even though they acknowledge the facts, something that we appreciate, what the state is saying that they just have to wait and be patient while they abusers uh, use delay tactics. And as Commissioner McQually and the president re repeated then, it is important to go back to our petition so that the commission can carry out a virtual visit to assess what's going on and present a technical note. So the state could start by giving support to these requests. Now, with regards to some of the statements presented by the state, first of all, I would like to say, to talk about what the state says that the de ta delay tactics um, have nothing to do with uh, a de an intention of the justice, but the fact that these, these uh, interventions or motions cannot been, uh, cannot be uh, eliminated. But we're talking about motions that have been solved 
multiple times that sometimes even question the constitutionality of the law that was actually presented by the public prosecution. So as a consequence, the defenses usually uh, present cascade motions one after the other, which delays the entire process, even though the court has sometimes rejected these motions. Uh, there has been no uh, in limine rejection or anticipatory decision to prevent this from happening. The Inter-American Court has said that judges need to lead the process so as not to obstruct justice. And they have said that they need to guide the process so that remedies are not used as delaying tactics. And this is what's happening with the suspensive effect for all the remedies. Of course, there are cases uh, in the Uruguayan case law where there was a, a, um, a rejection to the suspension, but it is not what always happened. And with regards to the statute of limitation and what the president of the commission was saying, though it is true that the um, motions presented by the uh, accused have not uh, prospered, have not uh, been accepted, this has nothing to do with the state policy. The judges interpreted that the term is started to be count since the uh, revocation of the prescription law, but the doesn't. But that means that these crimes could still be part of a statute of criminations and could uh, lead to a prescription at some point. I will now give the floor to my colleagues. With regards to the rights of health. Uh, We've lost progress since March 2020 because we lost with the, because there was an interruption of the contract with uh, psychiatrists and psychologists. So the state is not ensuring our access, the access of our children and our access to mental health. Um, and with regards to truth, we are we always say that it is a necessary complement where there is no justice because in some cases some of our torturers have died so we talk about a public truth publicly known that is uh, that reaches everyone who is unaware of these facts or say that are they are unaware of this fact and we should this should be done through public policies, through communicational tactics, because we think that communication, mass media could um, disrupt this lying account installed by the state that this was a war, which was not the case. They minimized the systematic uh, plan against the civil society and especially all of the crimes where there was gender-based violence. We say that there is no genderless torture, but that, I mean, we're not saying that torture has a gender, but there are certain kinds of torture that have very specific consequences on the bodies of women. I will try to reply to some of the questions we were asked and the others will be sent in a written form. Specifically, Commissioner Mantilla was asking if in our country there's a specific uh, specific um, guidelines with regards to um, gender-based violence during the dictatorship. Commissioner Piovesan was asking if there is a protocol for sexual violence victims. There is no specific protocol, especially for the victims, sexual victims during the dictatorship. We do have internal regulations that have been trying to, that they, they, they would, people try to adapt them to international standards but many legal officials still resist to implying them. Many of them say that they do not apply to this case. So 
we can see how they interpret the current regulations in our country. I specifically talk about the law on gender violence, which has specific points that would allow us to give our petitioners a specific status as victims, which they are not receiving right now. I would like to say that last year they were uh, subpoenaed as witnesses and those who interrogated them were the defendants of the accused parties. This is re-victimization. What is this if it's not re-victimization? So we want to make clear that victims are not treated as they should be in Uruguay. In Uruguay. Now, with regards to economic reparation, as, Urujola, the, as Commissioner Urujola was asking, there are reparation law reparations law that are very general. Many of the claimants are not covered by these laws because in Uruguay, to use these regulations, especially the last one, the newest one, you need to qualify as a victim. And I would like to bring up the recommendation of the National Institution for Human Rights from 2018 on the case of an adult woman who, when she was a child, she was victim of sexual violence and she was not uh, considered a victim because she did not, uh, she was not covered by any of the provisions of the regulation. So the recommendation is to modify this because it leaves out uh, many, many victims who are claiming for the right to reparation. And this is uh, rejected by the state. Several years ago, uh, it was recommended by other institutions from our country and from abroad. And with regards to the rest of the considerations, well, we will send them in a written form, especially the questions asked about uh, stigmatization. But I will say that this is reflected clearly on the the amount of feminicides that we have in our country because it's not casual it's violence that's pervasive that is always there the same violence that affected the claimants thank you very much i would like to thank the representatives from the civil society now i will give the floor to the state for 10 minutes thank you Well, we took down note of the questions and comments. Once again, I would like to stress that the state is totally willing to move on with whatever progress can be achieved on these issues and to make its best efforts to overcome the obstacles that are perhaps are in the way. Now, whatever is left unanswered today, the state will answer it in a written form in order to fulfill, to reply to all of the questions that were presented. I will now give the floor to the judiciary and then to the secretary of the recent past, Madam Luján Criado. Now, with regards to the questions presented about training on human rights and gender-based violence, here I have a short list of courses that have been provided the judiciary in other cases at the commission has provided a detailed list of all of these courses, but just to give you an example, the courses the permanent training courses for judges and for those who seek to become judges. We have uh, courses on gender-based violence, domestic violence focused on evidence where we highlight maybe not what is known as the burden of proof and the inversion of the burden of the proof, but the actual problems victims face when trying to prove 
the crimes they have suffered for being women, discrimination and violence based on gender, institutional, I'm sorry, international constitutional protection tools where we study the European and inter-American human rights systems, also a workshop on good practices for gender-based violence, um, evidence with gender-based perspective, where we address how difficult it is for victims to provide evidence, training for using the guidelines on uh, gender stereotypes and international standards on women's rights, systematization and record or registration of cases with a human rights approach. We study um, the uh, rulings of the Inter-American Court or uh, statements by the Commission. We talk about conventionality control. We have also, at least since 2014, because I am a graduate of um, international degree on human rights with a specialization on human rights, which is create which, uh, which was created by several organizations. And there's a specific module that studies the inter-American system for the protection of human rights. We study the jurisdiction of the commission and of the inter-American court and its rulings and sentences. And this program also studies conventionality control. In Uruguay, no existe el With regards to jurisprudence, uh, there our system, even though the in our system, even though the Supreme Court issues a ruling acknowledging the rights of people who violated rights during the dictatorship, each of the judges of the system are independent when uh, ruling on their cases. But it is also true that one sentence that what had a lot of repercussion, repercussion was one from 2009 in which the Supreme Court stated uh, that the uh, law, the prescription law was unconstitutional. On that ruling, the there was a mention to the constitutionality block. So even though the, um, the court did not elaborate, it established that international treaties that recognize human rights have a um, constitutional hierarchy. So several treaties were giving a priority, for example, the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights. Another question that was posed was more of a technical question. If there was a chance to warranty the non, warranty the non revictimization of the claimants, the judiciary has created um, portable uh, booths that protect the identity of witnesses in order to protect them, and there are there's a record system which is more efficient and it has also started using video con relación a las a las defensas opuestas por eh, los with imputados. regards to the motions presented by the accused parties yes it is true that case law in our country is not completely uh, coherent when it comes to recognizing these crimes as crimes against humanity. But as we pointed out on March 11 this year, the Court of Appeals rejected the defense or the exception of prescription presented or filed by the attorneys of several of the accused. 
I don't know if there were any other questions with regards to, to for the judiciary. We can answer them now or we can answer them in a written form uh, if you find it necessary. Good afternoon, everyone. I would just like to say two things that have to do one of them with reparations regardless of the result of a conviction as a result of a proceeding the secretariat of human rights for recent for the recent past works very closely with the special commissions that create that create through several uh, laws issued uh, uh, created in our country, we try to um, receive, uh, we try to investigate proofs in order to provide reparations. Yes, it is true that the application and budget is different the, in the case of uh, Act 18596, it includes psychological and psychi psychiatric care for victims and their family members. Uh, with regards to this, with regards to the question about the interruption of the care, it's not that the service was interrupted, but there was a period, a very short period in which it may have been interrupted. This is this depends on the um, Ministry of Health, which may have stopped to pay uh, health providers for their services. As far as we understand, on September 2020, these payments were settled. Um, our control body detected this debt, and that is why it was the, the, the debt wasn't paid before. But it doesn't have to do with the non-renewal of the contract. It had to do with a, an administrative issue and as far as I understand, this was fixed in September, so the service should not have been interrupted. Still, we will try to find more information about this and clarify the issue. Thank you. Okay. As far as we understand, we've given the all possible answers, and I repeat, the state, I mean, whatever we were not able to answer, we will do so in writing with the due precision and accuracy. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Thanks to all the representatives of the state, as well as to the representatives of the civil society organizations. It would be very important for us to get to know afterwards, I mean, not now, of course, but the proposal that the civil society organizations made and that we support for this virtual visit and for a technical note in terms of standards, we repeat our availability to help and to support on that. And we will be waiting for the assessment by the state of the possibility of accepting these requests. I would like to thank everyone that has been present here, but in particular, the victims that have been present here in this hearing. Of course, sexual violence in armed conflicts and in dictatorship is an issue that has been invisibilized for a long time because of the serious violations conducted during dictatorship times, it was established that the urgencies were missing people, the murders, and all the rest of the reports were focused on those things for many years, on those victims for many years, and not on the victims of sexual violence without taking into account what something else that is the stigmatization and the how shy or the shame that that could create for victims. It is also important, therefore, to point out that in the transition to democracy, 
the declarations of sexual violence were not visibilized. As an Argentine author said, the topic was there, but it was invisible because nobody wants to know. That's what the author says. And that's why these kind of hearings are so important because they make this visible. And this is something that happens in the whole of the continent. Sexual violence is used to hush the opposition, to hush dissidents and to hush journalism as well. This week, I have to say this, the Inter-American Court knew about the case of a Colombian journalist that was tortured, kidnapped and victim of sexual violence. And on Monday, she gave her testimony to the Inter-American Court. She has been asking for justice for 20 years now. So I hope in these cases of sexual violence, I always quote the same author, but I think she hits the nail, really. Uh, the sexual violence of women in the continent has been invisibilized. So she always says that we need to expand our capacity of hearing the silence. Therefore, I thank the victims in Uruguay, and I hope that this space will be a space for hearing those silences, the silence that you've been keeping for so many years and that you wanted to be heard. Thank you so much indeed, and I thank everyone for their participation in this hearing. Till next time, big hug for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President.